I was trying not to uh, like hi say hi too much. Good evening, everyone. I know everybody's very excited. It's a very exciting evening. And it's also a very beautiful evening. So people are, I think we still have some folks who are enjoying the weather, which is absolutely fine. Uh, hello, I'm Kate Markert. I'm executive director here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. And it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you here for this very special celebration to mark the opening of Balca de Vries's War and Pieces. This, and I hope many of you have already seen this a totally fabulous installation um, that really functions as a bridge between old traditions and contemporary design. It completely transforms the dining room at Hillwood. <laughs> It, of course, was inspired by 17th and 18th century centerpieces that were crafted in sugar and porcelain. And it's a modern interpretation of this tradition. At Hillwood, we are always looking for the perfect contemporary work of art that, that will look at home in our beautiful spaces. And War and Pieces adds this incredible, unexpected, and dynamic contrast to this fantastic grand period room. Porcelain, of course, was one of Marjorie Merriweather Post's great passions. And she almost always used historical services when she entertained. So she was always exposing her guests to past styles and traditions and teaching them, really, about French and Russian culture. So we, when we are completely thrilled with how perfectly Balka's remarkable art installation sheds compelling new light on this important aspect of Hillwood's collection and how well it reflects Post's concern about nuclear war that resulted in her construction of fallout shelters throughout the estate. And of course, if you haven't had a chance to see the fallout shelter, you are welcome to visit this evening. They're not, it's not normally open uh, to the public, but it is available this evening if you haven't seen it. It's pink. <laughs> Thank you for all of your wonderful membership support and your dedication to Hillwood. Your, your enthusiastic participation really helps to sustain our exhibitions, programs, world-class collection of imperial, Russian, and French decorative arts, and our, of course, stunning gardens, which again, I hope you've had a chance to, to walk around. This, this is a perfect evening to see them. And your, your contributions really help us enhance the experience of thousands of our visitors every year. This installation itself is just one amazing example of the impact of your annual gift. And I would also like to thank the following friends who most generously sponsored War and Pieces. Many of them are here this evening. Ellen McNeil Charles. The Marjorie Merriweather, yes, always for Ellen, yes. The Marjorie Merriweather Post Foundation, Ms. Nadine Rumbo and Mr. Jan Rusenberg, Martha Johnston and Robert Coonrod, who are right here, yay. And Dr. and Mrs. Michael Petit. And I also want to thank Ambassador Andre Haspels, who is here in the front row. He is the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and we're so pleased to have him here tonight. We're ap so happy to have the support of the embassy, um, not only for this vibrant example of Dutch un ingenuity, but also as our very close neighbor. As, as many of you know, they're half a block away from us. <laughs> So I hope you will really enjoy the installation this evening. And if you haven't seen it, rush, rush over to see it. And come back again and again to experience this remarkable centerpiece. So now I'm delighted to introduce the brilliant Balka de Vries, the artist behind this masterwork. He was born in Utrecht, the Netherlands. And he studied at the Design Academy in Eindhoven and at the Central um, St. Martin's, London. 
after working with John Galliano, Stephen Jones, and Zandra Rhodes, he switched careers and studied ceramics conservation and restoration at West Dean College. He has been a full-time studio artist since 2010. His work can be found in numerous private and public collections, including the National, Museums of, National Museum of Norway, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Aberdeen Gallery in Scotland, among many others. So please join me in welcoming the brilliant Balka de Vries. Good evening, thank you all for being here. It's really exciting to be here. It's a, this fantastic house, and I mean, as you will see later on, once you've seen it, it my work sits so comfortably here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling straight at home straight away. So, as uh, Kate said, I'm from Holland, although I've lived 35 years in London now. I went there as a student and I never returned. Although I still have been very close ties with, with Holland, with my family there, and as it is so easy f to get from London to Holland, I still go there regularly. So, before I start telling you about my work as an artist, I just want to go over the fact when I was uh, a ceramics restorer, because that really sort of is the basis of what I started doing. And I wanted to illustrate that with a couple of projects I did in one year, which were all v so amazing, and it gives you a bit of an idea why I love that profession so much. And I still do some of it. I have sort of like clients that I've worked for 25 years, and I'm sort of too scared to say now, uh, <laughs> I'm done with you. I might still need them one day. So on the 2nd of January, several years ago, I got an e email from somebody. It was one of those emails. I was reading it, and sort of as I was reading it, my mouth had become came wider and wider and nearly hit the floor. And so this is a 3,000 year old Magna Grecian urn and it was in the in Golders Green Crematorium in London and somebody tried to break in to steal this and in the process broke it. And when they came in on the 3rd of January, the 2nd of January after New Year's Day, they found this on the floor with the ashes on the floor and uh, I got an email saying can you help us can you restore it and it's an amazing goal the gold screen crematorium it's, it's, it's a, it has a columbarium where you have uh, the ashes of uh, Anna Pavlova Amy Winehouse a really <laughs> a really amazing variety of people uh, but this is probably the most important one but I'll, you'll find out later why and so they said can you help us and so I arrived there and they just handed me this box and wow. they had swept up the ashes and put that in a container separately and they said can you do something with this so it was an amazing challenge and so when I get something like that I first out try to work out uh, all the fragments where they are the positions they are and I have the original photo of the original there and then you start putting it back together and here it's back together and those are the areas where it's filled and you can see here it's up where the impact was that it hit the floor here and then it touched it there and uh, most of those fragments were disintegrated and what we decided to do rather than trying to make it totally invisible uh, I only retouched the areas where where the fills were missing and there it is finished <laughs> and you know and this this you know, I ca there's something really magical about doing this job because I, it's, you sit there for hours with a microscope, with copy glasses on, doing fine retouching, only trying to touch the areas where it is missing so you don't uh, put any new material on the original object. Which often, I get to the little, with there's certain areas of restoration where people try to make everything so invisible that they end up covering a lot of the original. We come back to this later. So this is not a project. So this is a fast by the English artist Grayson Perry. I don't know if he's very familiar here, but he's a very important artist in England. He's very well known because he dresses as a woman at public events, which he has done. He started doing that as a 12 year old boy to get away from child abuse he was getting from his stepfather. And he wanted Turner Prize, which is the premier uh, uh, art prize in England, and he said, uh, 
I've done in restoration. There's a technique in Japan where you repair with gold, uh, you, you, with gold leaf on the break edges, and I always love this uh, idea of repairing because they're saying when something is broken, that's part of a history. Rather than trying to hide it, mm -hmm. you enhance it, and it becomes part of its history. And he, I've been restoring all his vases for years, and he contacted me one day and he said, "I've got an idea. Uh, this was." Uh, a, f a fast based on the career of a politician called Chris Hume who had lied about having driven a car and he pretended that his wife had driven the car and so she got the points on her license then they had a terrible nasty divorce and she spilled the beans <laughs> and they both ended up going to prison and he lost his career so uh, he said as a sort of example this was for an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery in London this was a portrait of the politician, the vase is scratched with uh, symbols of the political party and other things. And he was going to, his damaged reputation, he was going to put together again with gold. So he came with the perfect vase to my uh, studio, put it on the floor, got a hammer out and <laughs> smashed it. And then the first hit with the hammer, nothing happened. <laughs> It, you sort of hit it, and, and then he had to give it another tap, and then it just f came apart. So there it is put back together because it was incised with 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 uh, uh, it was scratched. All the pattern was scratched in, so I had to be very careful because any material, filler material, was going in those cracks. So I taped all the join lines off, then filled it, and then worked with the gold leaf, and there is the fast finished. <laughs> And there it is in the National Portrait oh, Gallery, yeah. surrounded with all these fantastic 18th, 19th century paintings. Yeah. And then the third object of that year was this piece. This was four days before Christmas. A gallery called me and said, do you do glass? And I said, yes, I do glass, but it's very tricky because glass is glass. It's, you see through it and you can't always hide it perfectly. And they said, oh, we have this emergency job and do you? And I said, well, come over. And I thought it was going to be a little glass panel that size, but it was more like, this size <laughs> and as I was working on it, it had to be done before Christmas as I was working on it I thought it can't be and I thought I mustn't think that it is by this artist because otherwise I'm going to be really scared and it turned out to be by this artist called Gerhard Richter mm. which is probably one of the world's premier artists and that is probably a four million piece of glass uh, so it just gives you a little bit of an idea of the things I get. In, I mean, I get also really mundane things like <laughs> grandma's cup from the 19th century. Or, <laughs> but I could also get to do these things. And then to go back to the urn, this tells you why it was so important. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was amazing because Sigmund Freud is real history. I mean, whether his theories are challenged now, he, start, he invented a whole new medical branch. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, he's so important. It, I mean, he's one of the big names of the 20th century. There's no doubt about it. And to actually be able to work on something like that contained his uh, ashes. And this urn had been given to him by Princess Marie Bonaparte, which was the last of the surviving royal Bonapartes, and she was one of his disciples, and she had given him most of his pieces that are, were in his study, but she also was the person that got him out of Austria and also negotiated with the Nazis to get all his belongings back. She paid him a lot of money, and she was a disciple. She gave this to him, and the family decided after he died uh, to bury, put his ashes in that, and now it's in a bulletproof case uh, to protect him. And one more little funny aspect of it was that his, the ashes of his wife Martha were in there as well, but was she, she was in a Ziploc bag. <laughs> 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 so Martha was saved. <laughs> and uh, so it was rededicated a year afterwards, and they managed to get all his descendants together. And Lucian Freud, the painter, was his last grandchild of his life. So it was all great grandchildren and great great grandchildren. And I was the only non or the only fraud there amongst the Freuds. <laughs> <laughs> so that just gives you an idea of the fascination of the profession of a restorer. But then about 10 years ago, I started thinking, 
I, I had been to art college. I really want to do something of my own work. And as they say to, but novelists always say, write about what you know. And I thought, well, make things with what you know. And coming back to restoring things, I find that there's something strange about people having a tiny little chip on something and they want it made invisible like it never happened. And I look at some broken pieces or broken objects and I think they can still be beautiful. And that was the starting point of what I started doing. And this was the first piece, very appropriate use, a bisque figure of a Dutch boy <laughs> that I had, uh, which was bought for me in 26th Street Flea Market in New York and it got broken in a move. And as things happen, you put them in a bag in a cupboard because you can't bear to throw them away, but you never do anything with them. And <laughs> so, I started making the pieces and I wanted to make them look like they had sort of like were in mid breaking, mid explosion. And what I used here, I used armature, uh, which they sometimes do in archaeological restoration, where they have an antique file, an a Roman or a Greek vase, and the whole site is missing, but they have one fragment, but it doesn't attach to anything. And they sometimes put then a perspex dowel in and place the fragment in where it would have been. And so. And then I add little details to it, like the little heart in this case that came out as it's broken. And there it is in its final. And that was the very first piece I made, which I still luckily own and it's always gonna stay with me. And here is the figure, a figure of Guan Yin. And it just sh gives you an idea how I start. I lay out all the pieces. I sometimes first salutate them together again. So I know exactly where they are. Then I number them, then I put them out. Then I make all the dowels, and the Guan Yin has been a figure that has been, become a recurring theme. Uh, she's the goddess of mercy and compassion from Buddhist tradition, and it seems rather appropriate to what I do. And there she is set up, and there she is, and then one hand sh she has bullets weighing the balance, and the other hand hearts, sort of a yin and yang of the good and the bad. And here's a few more Guan Yins. And what I use, I like to use materials that are of good quality. I don't really want to go the kitsch route, and this is all 18th century materials, say 17th and 18th century. Uh, on the right hand side, all the fragments, they are from a, a pieces from a shipwreck, from uh, a shipwreck that sunk in the 17th century and it has been excavated. And I, because of my job as a restorer, I have good contacts <laughs> with dealers for materials. and. As you start developing, people start to know about you and you start building up networks and people contact me. I've got somebody, a dealer in Holland, that looks out for me for things there and he just sends me pictures and said, are you interested in this? And that's how, it, and so what I use is pretty much all pre-19th century. So here are the Guan Yins and here are a few more. And I use the butterflies, I use quite a lot in my work because in Dutch still lives, when you see a butterfly, all, all the things in still lives have meanings, like every bee bug and every nut and every, and the butterfly is a symbol for Christ for the resurrection. And so I think my things have a rebirth. And the one on the left I just finished, it's going off to a new client. And then on the right I use the fragments to make a flower out of the porcelain shards. And then I, Coming back to sort of how being Dutch, you can't get around Dutch art from the 17th century and still lives. So I s decided to make a group of works which are still lives, but in 3D. This is a little 18th century armorial milk jug, and I sort of recreate the milk spilling out of it <laughs> in resin, and there it is finished. And here's a few more exploded teapot. There's a little cabinet cut cup from Berlin and here you can see some comparisons to the still lives although this one is a much darker one <laughs> but you know it's all about memento mori it's, it's it's the same thing it's the same principle and so that the flower after the the flowers have decayed and died and and but I'm always fascinated by the stories about when you see the Dutch still lives with animals and rabbits and things like that they had those things in the studio, but because they had them there and they didn't have refrigeration, they would be crawling with maggots and apparently the studio stank and, and I'm sort of fascinated by that idea. <laughs> and here are a few more still lives. 
and th that the fruit on the left side, that, that still is in sort of continuing decay, and it still is. <laughs> But it's sort of it's, it's sort of sort of it has a sort of found an equilibrium, <laughs> and he's in a still life where I've burned all the ceramics. I've, I've worked on a project when I was a student at restoration on a house in England where there was a terrible fire, and it had a really, really one of the most important ceramic collections in England, and it was all burned. Oh. And we, we went as students searched through all the fragments to see if we could still find pieces that went together so they could make a display of the pieces that got lost in the fire. So I did a whole series on, on burned pieces. Mm. And then we come to War and Pieces. So I, as you see, my, f my first piece, my works were quite small, and that's what I thought I was working in. And then I was contacted by the director of a museum in England called the Holborn Museum in Bath, which was a sort of a really old, fusty, dusty museum, and it got a lottery, lottery heritage grant for a, a huge redevelopment. And in the museum is a ballroom. It, was actually in the, it wasn't actually a, 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 a stately home or house, it was actually the hotel for a pleasure garden uh, in England. It's the only site that actually still has the original site of the pleasure the garden around it. And the house was actually never built to build, live in, it was actually to entertain in. Uh, when people had been walking in the park, they would go dancing in there. And it had a ballroom, and in the ballroom they made an eight-meter table with a perspex case around it to display the silverware and the porcelain, all the good pieces from the collection. And they wanted once a year contemporary artists to do something with that table. So they said, we would like you to be the first one, here's an eight-meter table, and do what you want. Which was quite scary. <laughs> <laughs> so. The, uh, the ideas behind it was this, were twofold. I'm always, says uh, Kate said earlier, the fantastic se centerpieces from the 17th and 18th century. I always loved those from what I had seen, and they used to be made in sculpture, for, uh, in sugar first, out of sugar sculptures, and sugar was a very expensive commodity when it was first coming from the West Indies, so it's only the rich people could afford it, and they made these amazing tablescapes with temples and figures and mythical figures and then when they discovered porcelain the technique of making porcelain at Meissen which they've been after for a long time because the Chinese kept the secret very secret <laughs> uh, finally by luck they discovered porcelain at Meissen and they started making all these table centerpieces in porcelain and uh, and Ivan Day did a sh show here, didn't he? And he's a food historian, and I then went to do a course with him. And he said, they ju at that time, they said they had discovered paperwork at Meissen that showed that the first modelers at Meissen were confectioners, and this, which sort of makes sense. And so that was the, the love that I have for those centerpieces, but I want to do an up-to-date version of it. So the other aspect was banquets and balls that were given before big battles uh, mm. and speci specifically the Water Battle of Waterloo uh, there's a reference to it in Vanity Fair by William Thackeray and on the eve of the Battle of Waterloo there was a grand ball a banquet given by the Duchess of Richmond which was pronounced to be the biggest and grandest ball that was ever given because people would actually all the aristocracy went over to Brussels uh, to be there to see the entertainment of war, I suppose. And you didn't just start a battle, that's pretty much all set dates when you were have your battle. And during the banquet, it was announced that Napoleon's troops were advancing and all the military personnel had to leave. And so I thought rather than having a glorify a real battle, we have the battle on the table between the sugar and the porcelain and also the plastic as the sort of more interloper material which is very much in focus at the moment around the world. So here are some examples of old drawings of those table centerpieces that were made in sugar. And here is some of Ivan Day's work, modern reworking of it, but very much in the traditional classical style. I mean, it's amazing what he can do. And then everybody needs, every suit to the table needs a good centerpiece. And I thought, what is this most devastating thing there is? And it's pretty much a nuclear explosion. But 
when you see pictures of it, it's strangely, hauntingly beautiful as well. And I quite like that sort of contradiction of something being so horrible, but also beautiful. So I decided I had to make the centerpiece as a mushroom cloud, but try to make it look as beautiful as possible and get everything sucked up into it. And then I, I came to it when I found this picture. This was after, an, uh, it, this wasn't after uh, Hiroshima, but this was in 1947 when they were doing some nuclear testing and they decided to celebrate it with a cake. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> so I started building my centerpiece and everything is going in there. And so all these, all these bits and pieces, they're all found pieces. All the little figures and the hats, they came from a factory in Germany, the Hummel factory. And they produced so much stuff that anything that wasn't perfect, they would throw away. And so that's gone into the ground and some Yes, somebody on eBay was selling all this stuff. He had found it and he was digging it all up and selling it off. So I contacted him and uh, I, I said, I've got so much money, send me as much as you can for that money. <laughs> and so I've, I've used up quite a bit, but there's still some left over. And then you have the figure of Guan Yin again, the goddess of mercy of compassion. But one of the Guan Yins actually has the head of Chairman Mao, <laughs> which was one of the worst criminals in history, and there's the, the Christ figures also being sucked up into it. And there it is finished. And then I, so the figures that are battling in the, uh, in the, in the display, they are, uh, it's, I think it's Minerva and Mars, and he's from the Derby figure. And I was allowed to borrow these from one of the dealer work clients that I work for, and I took molds of the different parts of it and then recreated them. I couldn't do them in porcelain because there was not time, so I did them in plaster, but I then gave them a finish to make them look like porcelain. And so here you see me making all the loose bits and pieces, and then start building up the tableaus. And you can see so there the ones are coated with sugar, the ones that are a bit more fussy. And I always love history, so historical references. And when you see the display, the f some of the figures pointing towards the mushroom cloud are carrying a flag. And I sort of reference there the picture from Iwo Jima, racing of the American flags, and Delacroix, liberty leading the people. And there. And so the, the figures are, are fighting because it's a, t a table centerpiece, they are fighting with knives and forks. <laughs> <laughs> and in the flags, there's two crossed knives, which is the reference to the Meissen crossed swords symbol. And there it was in its first incarnation at the Holborn Museum. And so I'm just going through to all the locations so you can just see how fantastic it's looking here. <laughs> this is. Well, this was quite special. This was at Charlottenburg Palace in the, the Rotonda. And mm. it's just so spectacular with the gardens behind it. And I haven't, I haven't shown a picture here, but the cutlery that was used was a set of cutlery that was made as a gift from Frederick the Great to Catherine the Great. And the handles have scenes of war in it. She, wo she won a battle against the Turks, the Ottoman Empire. And that set of cutlery had disappeared during the revolution and it came to auction in the early 80s and Charlottenburg managed to buy it back. And they allowed me to use it, which was pretty extraordinary. <laughs> and so as you see, every, at every location we did something different. We used, the th I used for the plate sometimes the theme from the museum and, or some part of its history. And here it is, Annie Castle, the house of the Duke of Northumberland in the state dining room. But I couldn't really go crazy with the ceramic fragments on the table there because it's a very expensive, <laughs> ancient <laughs> mahogany table with a perfect polished surface. But it did actually, uh, the <coughs> did have s several dinner parties around it. Wow. <laughs> and this, what we did for fundraising uh, for an arts organization called Outset in Holland. And we actually had dinner around it with carafes oh, of wine and it was, it was it was fantastic. We did four nights of it with I think twenty people every night, and we had candlelight and we had cups of wine and salt and you know it was just magical. 
and this is in Taiwan, the Ceramics Biennale, and actually you can't see it, but actually the surface is water. Oh. And, oh. and there were little pumps in it, so the water was rippling. Oh. And this is the Chateau de Nyon outside Geneva. Uh, Castle de Ursel in Belgium. The Gemeente Museum in The Hague. Bel Barrington Hall in uh, Herefordshire in England and he there's all the naval battle paintings around the world because the owner was one of uh, Nelson's lieutenants and there's a famous bowl with one of his ships a, a Chinese porcelain bowl and it has an engraved bowl a boat one, his boat inside the bowl and so we printed all the plates with the with that boat and there's another picture with it and that was set as a night sitting, so everything was dark, or everything was blacked out from outside. Mm -hmm. And they just did the little spotlights. Uh, 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 uh. This is the Harley Gallery in England. This is the What's With Athenaeum. I think we missed one out. Which so the What's With Athenaeum, that, that's the first stop in America. And we used uh, picture frames and mirrors from the collection. Yeah. And then we did print on mirror uh, the picture of the nuclear explosion superimposed on uh, the Hiroshima bomb yeah. and there's also some details uh, and they're sort of in, in, in based on Veracolimice paintings paintings on glass from the 18th century and here it is in Montgomery, Alabama and now we are in Hillwood so I'm just going to show you just a few more little projects uh, that I'm working on. So this is a group of works which are called memory vessels. And when I worked as a student as restoration in the V&A, I had to restore this Roman cinery urn that would have contained ashes. And when I started making my own things, I thought, what if you apply the idea of using a glass vessel to put the ashes into a broken vase, and you get the broken vase, have an exact replica made in glass, and then put its own fragments inside. And so here's a few examples. And there's a pair where one is perfect and the other one is broken. And this is a Worcester tea set. And then after War and Pieces, my next big project was uh, for this house called Croom Court. Croom Court is in Worcestershire in England and it's important, it's a great one listed house and it's important because it was the first house and first garden designed by Capability Brown, the landscape designer, but he also designed the building, although he, because he wasn't an architect, I think he had rather a lot of help with it. <laughs> so this house belonged to the Earls of Coventry. They sold it after the Second World War uh, this, some very important rooms from this, a tapestry room, is in the Metropolitan Museum in one of the state rooms that they have there. And uh, after it was sold, it became a school school. Then in the 1970s, George Harrison bought it and gave it to the Hare Krishna movement. Oh. And it became the Hare Krishna headquarters. And then they sold it and a property developer wanted to make it into a country club but because it's a grade one listed house, he wasn't really allowed to do anything to it. So he sold it to the National Trust. The National Trust already had a lot of the land and they got the opportunity to take on uh, the house. And what they decided to do is, because there was no content, and normally when you're working in a National Trust, I can tell you from experience that it's very rigid. <laughs> uh, you can't really do anything and it's like that's the Duchess's sewing table has been there for 300 years and you're not moving it <laughs> so with this house they tried to do something else because there was nothing there they tried to make an, an experimental house they were getting some things back from the family and but they wanted to display them in a different way and they also decided not to restore it they try they, they decided to leave it as it was sort of frozen in time, but they're not repainting or they're redecorating it. The, the flaking wallpaper is staying like that. So they were getting the 
collection of ceramics that had been in the house back and there's some very important Sèvres porcelain and they have amazing archive and they have actually got letters in the diary from the what was called the seventh earl the collector earl where he went to Sèvres and he said tomorrow I'm gonna buy this particular coffee pot and they have the receipt the invoices and we have the coffee pots but because it's a great one listed house they said can you do a display with it uh, you can't put a nail in the wall, you can't put a screw in the floor. <laughs> and so it was really tricky. And then I decided to do something completely different. And so I built a room within the room and it has some niches in it that shows you some of the uh, highlights of the collection. And then you go, there you see, and, and, and the mirror reflects the room and it reflects the landscape from Cape Woody Brown. Just to point out, the rather garishly decorated uh, fruit on the walls. The Hari Krishna did research in what they thought were the right colors, and they repainted it. I don't think it's quite historically accurate, but because it is part of its history now, they're leaving it. And so you can actually see the landscape reflected into the mirror. And then you go inside, you can see it. And then you go inside, and there's all the ceramics displayed against mirror again so when you get inside it just reflects and reflects and the whole point was trying to make people interested in the ceramics because you know try and get a 12 year old interested in a 18th century teapot <laughs> but when they walk in here it is so funny the amounts of wow that you hear when they go in there it's great for taking pictures and selfies and we even were allowed to put them on the ceiling And, it's, and it was supposed to be there for six months, but it's been so successful that they, it's, it's, gonna, it's now a permanent display, oh, wow, wow, wow. which is really great. And then just to finish off, there's another group of works which I called the maps, and these are very Dutch. This is actually, the, nobody will recognize it, but this is the map of 17th century Delft. Oh. This is how Delft looked. And I made the maps with fragments archaeological fragments from Delft. So these are all 18th century Delft fragments making up the map of Delft. Uh, and on the white is White Delft. And White Delft is the same as the blue and White Delft without the blue. And, <laughs> and but that was just for everyday use. That's what, pe what people had in their houses. And the blue and white was more for decoration in your house. And these things would just be broken. They would be thrown out of the window in the midden. And middens were really good for preservation. So when they dig them up, they actually were in generally in much better condition than a lot of ceramics when they are found. And there are some other versions I did. <laughs> There's Italy made out for a museum in Italy uh, from the regional pottery from that area. These work really well when the, the country is interesting and actually Italy has a fantastic shape. On the left is a map of South Korea. And that was done from, with fragments, celadon fragments from contemporary potter, from things that had gone wrong in the firing. And there was lots of, I was, had very strict instructions that the little island on the right had to be included because it was a disputed island with China. And hell would have been to pay if that island hadn't been there. And there's the map of China made of China. And it's all 18th century f blue and white. Oops. There is Britain. And I just made that for an exhibition about tea, the history of tea, which was shown at Compton Verney in England. And it's all in tea English blue and white transfer ware cups and saucers. And the exhibition is just finished and it's been bought by Fortnum and Mason for their new, they're opening their first store outside the UK. Not a concession, but a proper store in Hong Kong this month and it's gonna go there in the tea department. <laughs> and then we finish with Holland. Holland. So the map is made from the clay of Holland that made the objects, the objects are broken, gone into the ground again and now it's making the country. And this is the end.